Hi, this is Anna Raimondi. I'm coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and this is Talking to the Dead in Suburbia, and I'm so excited to have my guest, Lisa Smart, here. Um, so I will be talking to her about her experiences, and I hope that this will touch you in whatever way it needs to touch you. Lisa Smart is a linguist, book coach, and writer. She's the author of Words at the Threshold, What We Say When We're Nearing Dying, which is so exciting to me. What We Say is based on the data collected through the Final Words Project, an ongoing study devoted to gathering and interpreting the mysterious language at the end of life. I think that we should all be interested in that. She co-filicates, she co-filicates, am I saying that right? Facilitates. <laughs> yeah. Presentations with um, her research partner, Dr. Raymond Mooney, who we also will have on, um, who about language and consciousness at universities, hospices, and consciousness. Lisa has also written Canto Bardo, Veil, Diet for a Broken Heart, and Lessons in Lullabies. I'm so happy to have you here, Lisa. Uh, thank so you. Happy. Yeah. And I have to tell you at the front of this, I'm feeling a lot of energy from your mother. Is your mother ill? Yes. Yeah, your father's waiting for her. Oh, yes, he is. Yes, your mother is totally ready to go. Um, she's not afraid, and your father is not afraid to pass her on. They're kind of like like this like hippie thing, like all love and peace and all of that. Um, and your mother's okay. Your mother, as long as she has life in her, she's going to live but she's not afraid she's not afraid to go to her father to your father your father is everything to her so that, that being said at the front end i wanted to let you know that um uh, because there is peace and also your daughter your daughter um needs to understand that your mother needs to go okay mm -hmm. there's such a connection between your daughter and your mother that i feel like there needs to be something that your daughter can understand that your mother will always be around her no matter what. Okay. So that being said, um, so how did you get into the studying last words of the dying? Great. Which well, I think is fascinating by the way. Yeah. Um, thank you. Can I respond to what you just said? Cause that was amazing. Um, my mother is dying right now. She's been in hospice and, uh, she really is ready to go and um, her body isn't. So I just think that what you said to me and about my daughter is also accurate. They're very, very close and um, she hates to see grandma go. So your ability to tap into whatever it is that you tap into to know what is true is, is what that whole threshold is about. And I came into it through linguistics and um, what you were able to see without knowing me, without knowing my story, is what I discovered when I did this research. And I didn't necessarily believe in it at all. And that there is a language. I'm imagining that what you just did when you read this information, that there was something you were hearing, seeing, or Oh, I'm hearing it. You're I'm hearing it. Right. So that so isn't that powerful, right? We're used to thinking of language as this thing that you and I do together right now, talking. But actually, language works on many levels. So Dr. Evan Alexander, who we know from Proof of Heaven, he talked about the language of the afterlife as being non-linguistic, non-linguistic. So for him, he experienced communication in the afterlife without words, that people just had a sense of knowing. And... Um, and sometimes when I've uh, communicated with psychics who I've worked with when I did the research, sometimes they wouldn't even hear things as you do, which is a blessing and a gift, but they just had a sense of knowing. Yeah. And part of what the whole uh, Final Words project has been about for me, and I'll go into more detail about what the project is, is that language, you know, I was trained as a linguist at Berkeley, you know, language you know, linguistics were a string of words in a sentence. That's what communication was. Well, what I've learned through the research over the years is there are many, many, many ways that we communicate. And as people are dying, those multiple ways that human beings are able to communicate with each other are all highlighted. And as people are dying, they're much more psychic. They're speaking in metaphors. I've spoken to other psychics as part of my research 
and psychic mediums, and they talk to me about working in symbols that they have almost their own lexa lexicography, yeah. <laughs> you know. So for one psychic, an apple might mean innocence. For another psychic, it might mean temptation, but they have their own unique set of symbols that have. But your um, father is pretty straightforward. My father is a New Yorker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a New Yorker and I'm feeling he totally gets me. He totally, well, he totally gets me. <laughs> like, and your mother is also a New Yorker, yes? Yeah. Queens? Yes. I'm hearing the Queens accent. Yeah, totally New Yorker. So they're going to speak to you like very straightforward, okay? You're the only daughter of an only daughter, yes? No, my mother had five siblings, okay. but my father was an only child. Okay, because I'm feeling like you're an only child on one side, mm -hmm. um, and your father is fascinated with that. Um, but his last words were so fascinating. What were his last words? Well, he had a series of last words. I mean, the very final words were a reflection of the deep love my parents had after 56 years. They had, as you had said, you know, a very strong connection. And um, his final words to her were just, I love you, thank you, which is like, oh my gosh, can you ask for better words between a husband and a wife? But in the weeks before those final words, he said many, many things to me. One of them is this is a man who was uh, a scientist and a complete skeptic, and suddenly he started seeing Not anymore. Huh? Not That's anymore. New York, right? The, the cigar in the mouth, give me a- Not anymore. Me. Oh, not oh my God, not anymore. You are not kidding. He knows now. I absolutely have that. But he yeah. pours that on to you. Uh-huh. So did. that you can pull that through. So you can pull through who he was mm -hmm. and who he is. Mm -hmm. But his last words were, what were his last words? Well, they were, as I had indicated, he said his final words, the very final word, I love you, I thank you, and thank you. But he had a series of things that I wrote down. As a linguist, I was used to writing things down, especially if they intrigued me. So he said a range of things, anywhere from uh, the angels tell me there are three days left, only three days. No one's to blame, only three days. And indeed, three days later, as if he were indeed communicating with the angels, he passed away. So um, he also, when his secretary said, you know, Morty, how are you doing? And this was just a couple of days before he died. He said, you know, Alice, uh, this is very interesting. I've never done this before. <laughs> he never did. He well, never did. did. Well, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but, but when he said that, I became really curious about what the this was. When he said, I never did this before, was he talking about dying? Or was he talking about some other kind of experience he was having? Because all of a sudden, a man who never believed in angels was talking about angels. And um, he was making references to friends of his who had passed on, who he felt were trying to communicate with him. So as he was dying, and I wrote down all his final words, the three weeks that he was actively in the dying process, you know, I was surprised by the kinds of supernatural experiences my dad had, especially as he was a salt of the earth guy, down to earth New Yorker, who said to me that he was a gastronomical Jew, that his idea of praising God or any kind of spirituality was a corned beef sandwich, right? <laughs> so, but he moved from that. You know, he moved from that. Oh my gosh, yes, because he's tell me I mean, my experience is that actually i just happened just happened to have this i i did a book of poems called veil vale, and about two months after my dad died he started um reading telling me poems to write to my mother and but he always um, wrote poems to your mother he you know? always write poems i do He's know saying, i always wrote poems to her you are really a wonderful medium oh. and it such an honor to be with you and in this conversation. Well, I'm an honor to be with you because you channel this. <laughs> You're bringing this through. That book is very important, but the more important book is the one you wrote after yes. he passed. Yes. What is the book you wrote after he passed? It's Words at the Threshold. Okay, that book was totally channeled to you. Do you know that, right? You know, I felt like it was because I thank you for that. Thank you for that validation. My experience of writing the book is after my after I heard these unusual words from my dad as he was dying. And as a linguist, I became curious. 
I became completely obsessed with understanding more about people's final words. And I had this seven years that felt completely channeled. Like everything I did, I took all these risks. I quit a job. I was making very good money at a job in Napa, California, at a beautiful home. I was making good money. I gave it all up <laughs> to, to move to Georgia to work with Raymond Moody and do this research. But I had no doubts. It was as if, just as you said, I felt this, I felt spirit completely guide me. And it was one of the most magical times of my life. Your father's saying that him and your mother were a little bit hippie-ish. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, like he's showing me like the West Village or the East Village, like standing on a corner, like talking about poetry or whatever he was talking about. But it came from his soul. Okay. Uh -huh. Your father was a very old soul and you carry through what he wants through your work and it's very exciting so you created the final words project with raymond moody who we're going to have on this podcast um who coined the term near-death experience in the best-selling book life after life how did your partnership come to be with him because your father's clapping about this <laughs> and i think he was orchestrating the whole thing just as you indicate you know as you indicate well the way it happened is as my father was dying as i mentioned and as a linguist um, I was just tracking his words and I was completely intrigued by the kinds of things I heard from my father, especially since at the time he was an identified skeptic. And that's how he talked about himself. And, um, and after he passed on, I became very curious about final words and began to read everything I could about them. And among the things I read was Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, because I was asking all the kinds of questions that we often ask ourselves after someone we love passes on. And what happened, the coincidence occurred when um, I, mean, I think it was about uh, maybe a month after my dad died and I was really interested in this final words stuff. Um, I was at Temple and one of my mother's friends came up to me and said, how you doing? And I said, well, you know, it's hard. I was close to my father. And he said, yeah. And, he said, and I said, you know, I've been really curious about final words. My dad started talking about angels and you know, things I'd never heard him talk about. And I just wanted to know more about people's final words. And he said, you know, funny thing, I'm going to be co-teaching a class with Dr. Raymond Moody um, in a couple of weeks. And why don't you join us? And I said, well, what does it cost? He said, well, it's for five days. It's, you know, not, you know, it's a couple grand. I'm like, oh, you know, because I was a school teacher and you know, it was, that was tight. I mean, I was making decent money, but, you know, I was all tight. So I, um, a few days later, Coincidentally, <laughs> I got no coincidences. We know that, right? <laughs> right, we know that. My tax refund came, and it was for the exact amount I needed to get me there and take the course. So I took that as definite channeling or sign from spirit, and I went to this workshop with Rain that Raymond Moody taught, and he was the most humble man you can imagine. I mean, this man sold millions of books. Yes, so humble, sweet as can be. So day one goes by, he talks about near-death experiences and, you know, the workshop's going on. And then day four, he says, you know, I'm really interested in people's final words. And I was like, really? <laughs> and then he said, you know, all I'm looking for is someone trained in linguistics who would might want to join me and, and to do this research. Oh, so why linguistics? Why can't you just accept it the way it is? Why does it have to be linguistics? It doesn't have to be linguistics. It doesn't have to be, you know, because there are ways of discovering or discussing what happens at the threshold through many different disciplines and perspectives. But I went to school for linguistics. That's my training. So what happened is that's the lens I bring to this experience. That's the gift that God gave me or spirit or whatever. Just as you're a brilliant psychic medium, I'm right. it's what you bring through. Yeah. So I see the world in terms of how language reflects consciousness. I look at what language reveals to us about spirit. That's my way of looking, you know, that whole thing about the elephant and all the blind men who see, right? So, you know, that's what I have. And I don't think it's any more right or anything. I just think it's complimentary. It's, way. it's just a different way of getting there. A different way of getting there. So in your opinion, what does the end of life speech say about consciousness? Like your father said things to you, he passed on poetry to you. Exactly. He's a poet. Your father was a poet and he passed on this poetry to you. What is that? How do you, what do you make of that? Cause you heard it, right? 
Right, I heard it. So there are two things that happened. One is I had the after death communication. So after my dad died, I heard things in my mind that I wrote down. But while he was actually actively dying, right, and he was still alive, there were changes in his language. And what they first were the kinds of things I talked about is he started seeing people in the room and seeing uh, spirits. But the other thing is he started speaking in metaphors that are very common when people die. So he started talking about taking a trip and going to Las Vegas, which was one of his favorite places to go. And he was like, we got to get ready for that big trip to Las Vegas. And, um, you know, and of course, some people are like, honey, we're not going to Las Vegas. And he's like, oh, yes, we are. We're going on this big trip. So we know that this is a very common thing that people are dying, start talking about a trip. So this is one way for me that validated this whole idea of that there's some kind of traveling that's going on, right? So you have the metaphors of the trip and you also have people as they're dying often use the metaphors that are dear to their hearts and their lives. So someone, for example, um, Jeffrey Holder, let me make sure I have his right name. Here. Jeffrey Holder, I'll have it right here, um, was a choreographer and his very last words were arms, two, three, four, turn, two, three, four, down, two, three, four. And, you know, we know Steve Jobs of Apple Computer said, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, right? He, he saw something at the threshold. And this is what I mean. For me as a linguist, I'm looking at the language as um, validation or reflection that something beyond this world exists. Because what was Jobs speaking? You know, what was he talking about in those very last moments? Um, so depending on who people are and what they bring to their lives, um, you know, don't cry for me for I go where music is born, which was Bach. Don't cry for me, I go where the music is born. Those were his final words. So, and when I, I collected now, it's been about 2000 utterances from people before they die. And what we hear from people as they talk about the things that matter. So for example, one daughter, her father, who was a contractor said, oh my, oh my, kitchenettes, bathrooms, so much for me to remodel. That's what they, ma that's what matters to them. But right? that's what matters. So, you know, we die as we live in many ways. And that's just, right. you know, as you're die saying- Die as we live. I really think that's key, is that people don't realize, like when I do readings with people, like they bring apart, they bring through, things that they did when they lived, but that's who they were. Yeah, exactly. What were your father's final words to you? To me, um, what were they? That's a really great question. But this is where this all started. He got you in the right direction. Right. So, you know, many times I had the very last words to me. I just remembered the exact ones were, oh, Lisa, there's so much so in sorrow. Now, technically, that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. But this is what I got intrigued about the language of the threshold. People start speaking in a kind of nonsense that makes sense. Right. So, so in sorrow, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. But he was a very happy, he had a very happy life. And he really loved your mother. And he really loved you. He really did. And he really loved my mom. I mean, they had a very passionate. Oh, is your mother in hospice? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because I feel like she wants to live as long as she can live, but she's ready to let go. She really, I, I just, um, frankly, she misses your father. She misses my father. And she said to me just last night, she said, I've had a great life. There's nothing more I could want. I had passion. But I feel like she hit it at every point. She, she did, did what she had to do. But your daughter may have a hard time with this. Yeah, my your, daughter. Her name begins with a knee? Yes. Yeah, she may have a little bit of a hard time with this. Um, but so you've also written a book about this, about what have you written a book about? Um, so the book that I wrote, do I have it here in my desk? Sometimes I do. Oh, here, I happen to. It's called Words at the Threshold. Yeah, and that is, what is that about? This is about what people are saying as they're nearing death. So this is wonderful. Yeah. Because I don't think that like, I mean, I do readings with people all the time and they don't really, they don't really listen to what people are saying. 
before they died. Now, your father was, um, I feel like he was a poet. He was a writer. He was deep heart. He was a little bit of a hippie, okay? Um, and he passed that on to his family, and that's important for you to pass on. You're doing your work. You know you're on your path. There's another book. There's another book here for you. Yeah, you know, it's funny you should say that because um, uh, while we're on this topic because it's so close is I did decide I wanted to write another book. This is called Words at the Threshold. And I want to do a book called Healing at the Threshold. I think that's important. Yeah, that's important. And also the last words of the dying are sometimes disregarded as nonsense. Exactly. Not nonsense. What's the result of delirium or whatever? But is there something else going on there, do you think? I absolutely think so. You know, just like the sentence I told you a moment ago, there's so much so in sorrow. Now you can listen to that, trying to look for making sense. God darn it, it has to make sense. But if you take it in through your heart, you know what he was saying is, I'm full of grief, there's so much sorrow, you know, and this is so much so, <laughs> you know, and it was sort of just a very simple sentence like that was really actually, even though it's nonsense on the surface is also very profound and you know a lot of people might say i want to go home i want to go home and their loved ones will say honey you can't go home you're in the hospital you're not you know you can't you're dying and when you go deeper home is not you know 1324 main street it's a home for all of us right but it's right here and it's right there yeah that's yeah. true so it doesn't have to be this conception of heaven you know it has to be it's another dimension Okay. I, yeah. And that your father, who I don't feel like had a concept of what that may be, he's in this other dimension. Okay. Waiting for your mother. So I really, I really sense that. And he, um, and I always feel him with me. And I, um, recently I started writing musicals. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I went through musicals really about death. No, they're actually, they were actually about my last marriage. <laughs> my ex-husband uh, just like walked out on me two years ago, very unexpected. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> I was like, what? And the way I dealt with my grief is for the first time in my life, I started playing music and my father loved music. And I really feel that he's kind of on my, around me as I'm taking music lessons at 62. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, and good not old. Huh? Not old, depending on who you're talking to. Not old. So in your opinion, what does end of life speech say about consciousness? Well, I think, um, well, let me get a little more specific so I can answer that question more fully. For example, one of the things that we see as people are dying, they'll do something called what I call sustained narratives. So let's say two weeks before they die, they'll start talking about the train station is all crowded. And if you just hear that out of context, you think, oh, mom, God, grandma, grandma's crazy. I don't know what the heck she's talking about. And then a few days later, she might say, yeah, but now we're getting a little closer to the train station. Now, these words or phrases come out of context over a period of weeks. So if you're not writing them down and tracking them, you know, everyone, different people are hearing them and they seem like nonsense. But if you actually write down and track what people say over a period of weeks, you know, first it's the train station is far away. The train station is getting closer. Oh my God, pack my bags, let's get ready. Oh, here comes the train. Ah, I'm getting on to the train. Yes, yeah, very metaphorical. Very metaphorical. And it goes over a period of two to three weeks or a week. So you'll see these, what I call sustained narratives. So something like that says to me, here's someone who's supposed to be dying, which means our functions are completely denigrated and falling apart. And yet how does someone on some level keep track of this story over a period of two to three weeks that ends with them going on a trip? Do you see what I'm saying? So yeah, it's you, pretty fascinating. It's really fascinating. And you see these kinds of metaphors of complex language that you wouldn't expect from a dying brain because a dying brain theoretically shouldn't be able to you know, remember a story over a period of time or to create complex metaphors or to see someone who is dead, um, who they didn't even know was dead in the room with them. You know, you hear stories like when I interviewed people, there may have been someone, a, a family member who died in a car accident two nights before and they didn't hear about it. And yet they'll say, oh, strange thing, Sarah's in the room with me. Well, actually, Mama Sarah did pass away, you know, so there's there so what makes me believe that consciousness continues 
is a variety of things from what people see, the hallucinations people see at their bedside to the kinds of metaphors or the ideas of taking a trip or the way people often know, like my dad did, three days left that they're gonna die. So, you know, it's really important that we listen closely to what the dying are saying. My mother said to me a few months ago, she called me up and she, from hospice and said, oh my God, I got all these boxes here and I need to pack them all up. Well, I knew she didn't have boxes. She was in diapers, in bed, dying. And I'm like, tell me a little bit more. And she said, yeah, I got a lot of wrapping up to do. I got a lot of wrapping up to do. So she was talking about the boxes, but when you listen closely, she needs to wrap up more things, right? So wrap up a life. Wrap up a life. So I went out to California about three months ago and I just got back last week and I was with her and we did a lot of beautiful wrapping up together, not just of her and my relationship, but we did so much healing. I, I just can't believe what we were able to do well, together. She's so bonded to your father. Yes. Yeah, like... Like at a very young age, she was bonded yeah, to him. And 18, she's bonded 18. to him. So, yeah, she's completely bonded to him. But I feel like your father's death kind of put you, like it got you in motion for the things that you need. And he's very happy about that because you took it and you went. Like you went after it and you did whatever you had to do with, to bring it up. And you may not have ever done that. I feel that my father's dying was an incredible catalyst for me. And, you know, meeting Raymond Moody, who, you know, coined the near-death experience, who completely opened up the conversation about death and dying in ways that hadn't been opened up before, and who's one of the most humble people I've ever met in my life, which is, good man. he's such a good man. But, you know, what a blessing for me. You know, I think one of the most important things in life is to have a mentor. Yes. And I you know, he, I've had a couple, but he has been an incredible mentor. And, um, and I just feel like my father and Raymond had a sort of affinity in some way. I don't quite understand, but um, I don't know. It's, it's just been. But your father wants the other book out. What's the other book? It's Healing at the Threshold. Okay. Because he wants the book out. He wants the book out like he his words were not he may not have had believed in some of the things that we're talking about but he believes now um and he's saying get it out get it out because it will heal people your father had a very big heart your mother know. has a huge heart <laughs> that's true huge heart huge. Um, he wants it out but you're doing really well are you coming out with another book well, I have two book ideas, so maybe you could give me a clue on which one it is. Okay. Uh, I have um, one about healing from sexual abuse, and my mother, my father was not the perpetrator, and my mother and I did a lot of, as she was dying, one of the main things we did was healing work around that. So um, that tentatively I don't have, is like diet for a happy heart or something about, you know, healing the heart from abuse. And then the other book is Healing at the Threshold about how the time before death, how we can use it as a time to make peace. I think and the second book is yeah. important. Yeah. I mean, were you bullied at some point? Mm, I don't think directly. I, I had some really horrible things happen to me, but they were part of the abuse. I mean, yeah. yeah. But I feel like you can talk about that later. I feel yeah. like you're pulled to the death. You're pulled yeah. to the words of death. You're pulled to what comes through because I don't think people really focus on that. And your, fo your father was so wonderful in bringing that through and bringing the poetry through, yeah. okay? And yeah. his poetry yeah. is all about love. Truly, truly, truly. And, you know, with my mother too, what's been, a, she was not really a believer, you know, um, in oh, terms she of- believes now. But she believes now. Matter of fact, she had this, said the sweetest thing to me while I was with her a few weeks ago. She goes, Lisa, I had my first encounter with God. And I said, Mom, it's amazing. Tell me more about it. And one of the things that was such a blessing that I want to write about in the book is because I study the near-death experience, I have a very strong sense of how and who God is based on people's stories. I said, tell me more about God, Mom. She said, his name is Herb. Hey, whether you call him Herb or Sam or the tree, who cares? <laughs> him or her? Like, do we really care about this energy that is all love? She gets exactly. it, but she gets it. She and your gets, father it. gets it. And your father's working through you. I feel like you have a lot of books in the working. Yeah. The, so I, your daughter? Does your daughter write? Oh, it's, it's really funny you should say that too. My daughter, I never, you know, she, when she was younger, she was just an athletic and very physical. And I, I never, you know, as mothers, we would always, it's exciting to see our daughters love what we love. 
but she was kind of a jock and it just didn't seem like she was going to want to write. And that was fine. I, I was like amazed she was a jock because I wasn't. <laughs> but then um, she got into a school she never thought she'd be able to get into, a very prestigious school. And I was we were both blown away that she did. And I was proud of her. And now she called me up last night. She said, I have an idea for an article I want to write. And I think I want it to be in the Atlantic. Good for her. And I'm like, she was on other way and your father's promoting her. Yeah. But you're doing your life's work and I feel like you're bringing so much to us. I hope everybody reads your book, you. Um, you know, Words at the Threshold, because I think it's important, especially for people who are going through their healing, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think it's absolutely wonderful. So thank you for what you give to us. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for all of you who have listened to today's podcast. Um, I'm so happy to have been able to speak to Lisa Smart. Um, I hope that you will, you know, follow me on my YouTube channel and my SoundCloud channel, and you will catch us for our next interview. But thank you from my heart, Lisa. Oh, thank oh, you. What a gift. Thank you for the psychic and for the reading. That was amazing. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs>